Veranda IES, where your dream becomes reality. Hello everyone. Welcome to the daily current affair analysis from Veranda IES. Today, we are going to see some of the important current affair topic from the day of 26th of June 2023. Moving on to the topics of the day. So as usual, we will be discussing some of the important questions from 2023 prelims and after which we will be moving to an opinion article analysis from the Hindu that is the United States of India which can be mapped to GS1 Indian society. After which we will be moving to the next topic, India and US agreed to end six trade disputes at World Trade Organization which can be mapped to GS2 international organizations. And the next topic is about Heliopolis Memorial. PM of India visit which can be mapped to GS1 history as well as a probable question can be asked based on the same topic with respect to uh, the mapping questions from geography. Then we'll be discussing about INS Sunayana which uh, can be mapped to GS2 defense system. Moving on to the prelims discussion. So the question is in essence what does due process of law means? Let us see the options. Option A the principle of natural justice. Option B, the procedure established by law. Option C, fair application of law. Option D, equality before the law. So due process is defined as just reasonable, fair and also a kind of an equitable treatment during the routine legal proceedings. That is, we should clearly understand what is this due process of law. So as a result, it refers to the impartial application of the law. So we can see the right answer to this question is option C that is the fair application of law. Here also you should understand that this due process of law also states that without following the necessary legal procedures and also receiving the necessary protection, a person cannot be deprived of their life, liberty or even their property. So the due process of law safeguards a person's rights and restricts the scope of the law. So why this question is being asked? What is the relevance? So it is generally to assess the basic concept of the student uh, of the subject of that particular candidature for the UPSC prelim. Moving on to the next question. Consider the following statement. First statement. In India, prisons are managed by state governments with their own rules and regulations for the day-to-day -day administration of prisons. Second statement. In India, prisons are governed by the Prisons Act 1894, which expressly kept the subject of prisons in the control of provincial governments. Which one of the following is correct in respect of the above statements? Let us see the options. Option A, both statement 1 and statement 2 are correct. Statement 2 is the correct explanation of statement 1. Both statement 1 and statement 2 are correct. And statement 2 are correct. And statement 2 is not the correct explanation for the statement 1. Statement 1 is correct, but statement 2 is incorrect. Statement 1 is incorrect, but statement 2 is correct. So here you should understand that one of the earliest laws governing prisons in India was passed in the year 1894 with the passage of the Prisons Act. 1894 with the passage of the Prisons Act. So according to list 2 of the constitution 7th schedule, prison is a state subject. That is very very important. Prisons come under the state subject. The primary role, responsibility and authority to alter the existing prison rules, laws and regulation, it rests with the states. Therefore, it is accurate to say that state governments manage prisons according to their own set of rules and regulations. And the Prisons Act of 1894 and the respective state governments prison manuals govern the management and administration of prisons which is solely the responsible of the state government. So we can say that the right answer to this question is option A, that is both are correct statement and statement 2 is a correct explanation for statement 1 also. So what is this relevance? Why this question was asked in prelims? The Home Ministry prepared a Model Prisons Act in 2023, Model, Model Prisons Act of 2023 to replace the British era law that is was a current affair which was there uh, in May 13, 2023. Okay, so that is why we can see that such questions was asked. So uh, these kind of uh, uh, topic were there asked in the news and we have to uh, take care or make a note of such kind of uh, current affairs also. Okay, moving on to the first topic of discussion which is a opinion analysis from the Hindu. So here in this opinion, the scholars argued that what distinguishes from the South India, from the Northern part of India politically is its language of politics. Then comes what its regional parties and their demand for more power to the states. 
then it's multiple languages and cultures it's counter cultures built through various anti caste anti brahmin and rationalist sort of liberal movements which happens in south india it's higher economic status and also its investment in so, so, uh, social sectors like that of education modern institution industrial infrastructure etc while the north lagged in most of these aspect but we can see that over the period of time now the situations are vastly improving but even then this is uh, the primary difference between the northern and southern part of india and also resulting in their socio economic development so in this opinion they discuss about the linguistic movements which was uh, considered as one of the crux reasons for these kind of uh, differences so while the north imagined india as a homogeneous nation that resonates with the, the hindi hindu hindustan slogan whereas if you see the south aspired to build india as a federation of nationalities that is states will be having more powers than the center as such or we can see here yeah, okay, rather than having a quasi federal state a uh, kind of a federation was the aspiration of the southern states so the print and publication culture it led to the formation of distinct linguistic public spheres in the south which were further consolidated by the cinema so all these kind of uh, mediums like that of a uh, print media uh, the cinema all these contributed for the political development especially in the south so by the early 20th century different linguistic communities in the south began to claim nationality status for themselves so if you see the kind of an example of kerala before the state formation of kerala it was actually three different kingdoms or entities we can see that travancore was there one cochin was there and malabar was there which is under the presidency of madras then the tirukochi state got formed and after that based on the linguistic formation of states happened the state of kerala was formed so similarly by the early 20th century itself the idea of language based states or nationalities came into existence especially in the south and these leaders were inspired by the political developments which happened in europe what happened in europe ah, the new nations were founded based on linguistic identity with the political objective of achieving popular sovereignty so this was happening uh, or one of the major trends in political development in europe in the earlier 20th century so the linguistic identity had proven to be secular flexible and also Uh, leaders thought it is more inclusive than the re, uh, religious or racial identity so then then madras presidency leaders continuously or consciously tried to cultivate it also especially the middle class intelligentsia from the south they recognize a crucial connection between language and also the liberal democracy and that is why one of the main reasons why they wanted this kind of a uh, uh, like language states a linguistic states and language should not be a barrier it is not a barrier as such let us see how for democracy to function it is essential to employ the language of the common people in the domains especially that of education administration judiciary without which we can say that equality or equity or justice cannot be delivered properly also you should understand that to perform this new role people's languages needed to be modernized adequately that means the flexibility should come so in the early times the language of english was not that much popular but right now we can see that that is not the situation however all these it was believed would be possible only when india was created as a federation of nationalities and these languages would perish if india uh, these languages would they they the scholars believed that the languages would perish if india were forced into a single homogeneous nation with uh, only one particular language like that of hindi or english rather though hindi and english are the official languages of our country the southern states or the scholars from the southern state demanded for that presence or the upper hand of the vernacular languages in those particular states so even a cursory look at the condition of the languages of the south today makes it very much clear that such fears are vindicated and the need for a strong bond so india is not a nation but a subcontinent of multiple nationalities right it's not only based on language but even if you see the culture geography it's like a kind of a european union where all these kind of a different states have different culture inside inside one particular state itself if you travels from one particular end to the other you can see within a 25 kilometers the food culture the tradition their uh, the, the language slang everything will start to change so unitary india would be sustainable uh, a unitary india would be sustainable only uh, sorry a unitary india would be uh, unsuitable for democracy which required the sovereign citizens to participate in the 
real decision making processes of the nation state actively that is the bottom up approach right so the panchayat raj system if you see that that was a clear example of this bottom up approach bottom to the top approach where the local people or the indigenous people of what one particular community are being participated in the decision making process so they argued that no single language could facilitate such a process for the entire subcontinent because we, we though we call india as a nation but we can see that because of its diversity india can be called as a subcontinent moreover a strong nation needs strong bonding among its people but the population of the indian subcontinent spoke multiple languages so no single language could bind them all as a national community so this was the uh, like a, a general perspective that was there especially in the southern part of india if you see as such so what could be the conclusion whenever like if you if, we, if such kind of a multilingualism a question based on that if it is coming in the means how can we diplomatically conclude that so we can say that overall by embracing and building a, to a kind of tolerance right we should always have the tolerance towards multilingualism towards the diversity of our country if we have that what will happen india can harness the power of linguistic diversity to strengthen national unity promote cultural richness enhance communication and also to foster socio economic development so it is through such inclusivity and acceptance that india can truly thrive as a multicultural and multilinguistic nation so you can uh, note down these kind of a conclusions to include this in your answer Moving on to the next topic. India and US agreed to end six trade disputes at WTO. So India and the US have agreed to end six trade w WTO through mutually agreed solutions and wherein India will remove what all uh, custom duties on 28 American products such as almonds, walnuts and apples which is having high pro prospects of imports into India. And also India agreed to remove retaliatory tariffs which it had imposed in response to the section 232 national security measures on steel and aluminum which are one of the uh, major exports from India to abroad. The US had imposed 25% and 10% import duties on certain Indian steel and aluminum products on the grounds of national security in 2018. And after that, what happened is that India had imposed custom duties on 28 American products in 2019. So this was the evolution of process which happened. Initially, US imposed 25% and 10% on the steel and aluminum products respectively in 2018. So what India did in 2019, India imposed custom duties on 28 American products. So this kind of a, uh, international trade regulations was eased out in the recent agreements. And now US has agreed to provide market access to certain Indian steel and aluminum products also. Not only really that, both countries they have agreed to terminate six outstanding disputes at the WTO. Which are the six disputes? One is countervailing measures on certain hot oil carbon steel flat products from India. Then certain measures relating to solar cells and modules. Then measures related to the renewable energy sector, export related measures. Then certain measures on steel and aluminium products, additional duties on some products from the US. And the US is the largest trading partner of India. And in 2020, to 2023 year the bilateral goods trade increased to approximately 128.8 billion dollars as compared to the 119.5 billion dollars in 2021 to 2022 that is the previous year so we can see that uh, us is considered that uh, this is a statistical evidence which shows that us is the largest trading partner of india so kindly note down what are the disputes in which we are we which we have eased out and here we are speaking about what is the evolution of events which resulted in this kind of trade disputes between india and us and how it has been eased out okay moving on to the next topic Heliopolis Memorial PM of India visit. So, what is the context of this news? Prime Minister of India will pay his respects at the Heliopolis, that is Port Taufik Memorial in the Heliopolis War Cemetery in Cairo, Egypt. So, why we have taken this news is that this kind of news are very important when it comes to the prelims for map-based questions as such. Right. So, such kind of international countries or places can be asked in a different format to map or uh, like uh, 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 or, or to locate or to identify the places as such. so it is very much important if any kind of a places to come in the news you have to open up your atlas and uh, have a note of it so the heliopolis memorial is part of the larger heliopolis commonwealth car war grave cemetery which is heliopolis if you know about it it is one of the very ancient uh, city in Egypt. So this memorial, it commemorates the memory of almost 3,727 Indian soldiers who died fighting in various campaigns which happened in Egypt and Palestine in the First World War. So we can see 
the, when you study the world history, definitely you'll be learning more about it also. The original Port Topic Memorial was unveiled in 1926 and was situated at the entrance to the Suez Canal. And this memorial was then destroyed in the Israeli-Egyptian War of 1967 by retreating Egyptian soldiers and a new memorial was erected in Heliopolis Commonwealth War Grave Cemetery in 1980. So there is a history for that also. The Indian troops played a very important role in securing the Suez Canal in Egypt and also in Palestine where Indian cavalry participated in the Battle of Haifa and also they played a very important role in Mesopotamia in the First World War also. So this port topic is now known as what Port Suez. Port Suez is located in Egypt along the northern coastline of the Gulf of Suez. Please locate that in the map. You should yourself open up your atlas and ma uh, map these ports and also these places. So the port and city mark the southern terminus of the Suez Canal which runs north south through Egypt from the Mediterranean Sea to the Gulf of Suez. So if you can see the Suez Canal is just like a small opening here we can see Mediterranean Sea and here you have the Gulf of Suez. Okay so in the southern side means here you can see what the port Suez or the earlier port coffee. So this port serves vessels transporting general cargo, OE tankers and both commercial as well as private passenger vessels. Please make a note of it. Moving on to the next topic, INS Sunayana visit to Kenya. What is the context? INS Sunayana visited Mombasa, is a place in Kenya, from 20 to 23 June 2023 towards strengthening bilateral ties with maritime neighbors on the theme of Ocean Ring of Yoga. Ocean Ring of Yoga. Why in uh, uh, like uh, 23, the date of 23 was very significant year also, you should clearly understand. Okay. Well, now let us discuss about INS Sunayana. So this is a Sarayu class offshore patrol vessel which was commissioned at Kochi and it is based under the Southern Naval Command and is built at Goa, Goa Shipyard Limited. And what is the purpose of this warship? It is designed to undertake fleet support operations, coastal and offshore patrolling ocean surveillance and also monitoring of sea lines of communications and offshore of assets and escort duties and also it can achieve speeds of 25 knots. The ship also has an automatic power management system and is fitted with the latest navigation, communication and electronic support system. Okay. Yes, please make a note of that. Moving on to the question of the day. Which of the following statements is true about INS Sunayana? Option A, INS Sunayana is an artificial carrier of the Indian Navy. Option B, INS Sunayana is a guided missile destroyer of the Indian Navy. Option C, INS Sunayana is an offshore petrol vessel of the Indian Navy. Or option D, INS Sunayana is a submarine of the Indian Navy. Which is the right answer? Yes, option C is a right answer. So, with that, we have come to the conclusion of today's daily current affair analysis. Unless and until we meet next time, this is Prince J signing off. Thank you.